Well, good afternoon, South Africa, and welcome to Afternoon Express, right here live on SABC3. My name is Danilo Acquisto. Now, I'm very excited about the show today because we're discussing some pretty pertinent issues. You would have heard all over the press this idea of the drought hitting our country, water shortages, etc. And you might be sitting at home going like, well, I still have water coming through my taps, so it doesn't really affect me. Today, we're going to be discussing this issue in much more detail. I'm honored to say that we've got the Minister of Water and Sanitation to share her viewpoints on what this actually means for us you and I at home, as well as for small businesses, rural communities, etc. It's going to be a fascinating topic to discuss. Plus, Andre Fenter, Afrikaans singer, is here in the loft with us, and he'll be sharing how he created a song for AgriSA to also help this drought crisis. And he's also joined by a representative from Gift of the Givers, and they'll be telling us what they're doing, just to show you that we actually are in a crisis in our country when it comes to water shortages. Now, that's the first topic we're discussing today. It's exciting. Our second topic we're discussing today is rural communities, particularly Particularly with all of these discussions, macroeconomic problems that we're facing in our country, what effect does this have on our rural communities? It's one of the biggest communities in our country, and it's important that we focus on what is going to happen to them and how we, you and I, can help them and support them in our different decisions with what we buy, our businesses, etc. It's going to be a fascinating show. Make sure you stay glued to your screens. My sugar plum is in the kitchen, and she's making something sugary sweet. Oh, that is so sweet, Danilo. Good afternoon, South Africa. I'm Bonnie Bouli. Welcome. So glad you could join us. We're getting up to some sweet stuff in the kitchen today. Nick is joining me and we're going to be making some sugar lumps right yes yeah, so I'm a really big fan of coffee uh, but there's something really ceremonial about tea um, mm. having a tea mm. party kind of gives you the opportunity to be a little bit more fancy yes and there's nothing more fancy than making your own flavored sugar lumps wow yes. okay awesome so let's get started okay so we're going to be using our salati granulated sugar right it's about half a cup you can use a food processor for this. Right. Um, just and you can use any color sugar? Um, well, you can use brown sugar, but you won't get the good, um, like, bright color if you're using, if you're flavoring and oh, coloring your course, sugar. Of course, of course. So that makes absolute sense. Yeah. <laughs> the brown would kind of just discolor it a little bit. So you've got your granulated sugar. Okay. Half a cup. You add a squeeze of coloring, just a little bit because the stuff is really, really potent. Right. And then we have a half a teaspoon of rose water. Rose water. So mm -hmm. you have to be sure that whatever flavoring you're using is a liquid, mm -hmm. because the liquid mixed with the sugar kind of keeps it together. You'll right. see later what I mean. I really love rose water. I love the smell of it it's as amazing. well. Yeah. And of course, pop over to our website, afternoonexpress.co.za, for the full recipe and shopping list. So we're just going to kind of use the processor to. To mix it up it. a little bit. Uh -huh. So you've got the colour going there. So we don't actually need that much liquid. No, it's really just a little bit. You'll see it kind of goes a bit busy, but the liquid just keeps it together. Yeah, yeah. So we're just going to go over here and I'll show you with, I've already made, pre-prepared a little bit here. Um, so I'm using a spoon because it's for shaping and moulding, okay. where you can use like chocolate moulds or silicone moulds, a melon baller, but I'm using the spoon because I like the shape that it makes. Right, So right. you have your your mixed sugar and you press it into your mold. Make sure that you press it really, really well. We and you turn it over and you pop it out. And you pop it out. Yeah. So um, this now needs to stand for like about an hour to dry out. And then once they dry it out, they can be stuck. Ah. And you can put it in a beautiful bowl for your tea party. And they'll look pretty. Exactly. Yes, and you can garnish them. What's yes. the best way to actually store them? In, in a fridge? Um, airtight. Airtight And container. not in a fridge. Definitely not. Because oh. the um, fridge, the moisture will kind of draw out of the sugar. Mm, okay. Um, you have it. So in a dry, cool, dark place. And what else can we use sugar lumps for? So the nice thing about these guys are that whatever flavor you use, you can be really creative and pair it with a different kind of tea. Say, for instance, you have a rooibos and you can make a lemon flavor, mm. or you can take your all grey and have your rose flavor. Okay. So, because there's so many interesting teas on the market these days, you can really get like super creative with it. Right. Get awesome. Done with it. Yeah. So that's them done. Um, yeah. So okay. um, we'll just let them dry out for an okay. hour because if you move them now, they'll just break. So you have to be really, really gentle with yeah. them. But yeah. yeah, it's really, really simple um, and impressive. All right. Can I pop one in the teacup? Yeah. Oh, there's one already. I'll yeah. Try one. They are so pretty awesome. and they smell so good. <laughs> Yay. I love tea. Tea time is the best. And also, like I said, it's a really good opportunity to be fancy with your friends and whip out your really nice tea set. We love getting fancy with our friends. Of course, <laughs> especially as girls. <laughs> mm. Yummy, yummy. 
The recipe is on our website, afternoonexpress.co.za. After the break, we're joined by the Minister of Water and Sanitation to get an update on where South Africa stands with regards to the water situation and where to from here. This is a very important topic that affects all of us, so make sure you stay right where you are. We'll be right back. Salati Plantation Select adds subtle sweetness to toffees, caramel, bran muffins or sprinkled into a spicy curry. Salati, always good, always sweet. Welcome back to Afternoon Express. Now, water supply is something that should not be taken for granted. We are provided with clean and safe drinking water, which is conveniently rooted to our homes and businesses. Right now, we are experiencing a drought, which, with the correct awareness, can be eased by everyday water users. With me is the Minister of Water and Sanitation, Ms. Nomvula Mokonyane, who will help us understand the current situation and how we can relieve some of the pressures of drought. Minister, welcome to our loft. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to your viewers. It's really cool to have you on the couch with us. I hear your voice every weekend on my radio show, and it's exciting to see government so proactive about trying to engage with the public on, on these issues, especially something so big as our water droughts. Let's, let's just expand a bit more on that. We've heard uh, in our country all over the news at the moment that some provinces are experiencing level two uh, uh, water restrictions. What exactly does that mean? Well, level two water restrictions uh, has to do with uh, really limiting uh, access in terms of the pressure of uh, water being supplied to the end user, as well as uh, replenishment overnight or during particular periods of the day, mm -hmm. as well as uh, increasing the capacity with regard to by law enforcement and uh, making sure that the end user becomes uh, a responsible user. For mm -hmm. example, domestic consumption, um, the irrigation systems, when can you irrigate? When can you actually water your garden? How best can you manage your own distribution of water if you're working in a big company mm. that is highly dependent on water? But it is a reflection that you live in an area where uh, the dam levels are far below 50%. So obviously that affects quite a lot of us domestically at home, and there's a lot that we can do. It's almost seemed to say, is, you know, nature can only do so much. It's up to you at home to make sure that you manage that water usage. What are some of the things that we can do at home to help uh, diminish this, this, this crisis? Not so long ago, the city of Johannesburg did a, a, a test of uh, a verifying the consumption levels in the city of Johannesburg, and guess what? 46% mm -hmm. of domestic uh, water in Johannesburg is used for gardening. It's not used for domestic uh, consumption and so forth. <coughs> Drinking. <laughs> not for that. Mm. It is for, the, for, for your sprinkler, it is for your swimming pool, it is for washing your car in your house. Mm. And uh, that also helped us in terms of upping our capacity of dealing with bylaw enforcement by the city, being able to communicate to communities to say, imagine if that was the last drop that you have used to garden your grass mm. and yet you do not have water to drink. And it is those things that we're beginning to say, every household can make a difference. Yeah. Imagine the time you spend when you're in a shower. You can make a difference by reducing the time you spend inside the shower, how you use your water to clean your car. Mm. Rather use a bucket compared to you using a horse pipe. Mm. Um, the, 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 those of us like me who use a, a makeup, why don't you get wet wipes and save uh, a basin full of water. Uh, we're looking at uh, interventions when it comes to our sanitation solutions in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the communities. Because many South Africans also did not realize that uh, the water mostly in our urban areas that we use for flushing our toilets is the water that you can cook your meal with. Sure. Mm -hmm. So you, we definitely have to also promote recycling, the use of grey water. Mm -hmm. But we also have to, without just talking much about what individuals can do. Government must also take responsibility mm. by having capable men and women who must look after this infrastructure, by being responsive when there's a best pipe, mm. by making sure that we don't only deal with me and you who have had water over years, we must also plan for the unsaved who yeah. have never actually had an opportunity of having drinkable water. But let's celebrate the fact that over the past 20 years, 
more than 85% of South Africans have access to clean water. Mm. And not only just access to clean water, I mean, we've traveled the globe and we've noticed that South African water is actually one of the highest quality waters that you can receive in your domestic house. It is it's really good quality water, and why would you use that to go to waste? Correctly so. Part of why we would always tell people that it's cool to come to South Africa mm. as a tourist is that you drink water from the tap. Exactly. But if you don't have capable men and women in the municipality, to maintain your water treatment plant, yeah. you will have the sewer spillages into our systems. Exactly. And that's why now as the Department of Water and Sanitation are now looking at the quality and capacity of uh, people in the local authorities that are supposed to deal with this issue because when, when we do the annual assessments of what we call the blue drop mm -hmm. for water quality and the green drop for an effective and an efficient uh, sewer system, we are quite concerned about some of the municipalities that have actually dropped the ball. Sure. And that's why we now have taken more than 86 of our water treatment plants in the Val River system, which is one of our biggest yeah, systems in South Africa, mm. to actually now come into our space so that we work with the local authorities to build their capacity but protect the precious uh -huh. quality of water in South Africa now. But it starts with me and you. Mm. We must protect our rivers. As you go having fun in our dams, don't actually litter mm. along the river banks. Mm. So behavioral change is also a reality. We're not just dealing with the drought. We're dealing with the realities of climate change. So it's a global phenomenon. So we need to also adapt. Yeah on how we do things as a nation. And Minister, we must ask, how is this whole process monitored? Because, I mean, some people at home might be thinking, like, well, I do my part, I play my part, but there's so many million people in South Africa. How do we know that this is being monitored correctly, that we're all contributing to this great cause? We do periodic assessments. Uh, our water boards and, and our own regulatory uh, unit in the department has got the capacity, including our municipalities, mm -hmm. because our resp responsibility primarily is to build big infrastructure, your dams, your, 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 your sewer pipes and the pipelines, yeah. but the water that must come into your house is dependent on the capacity of municipalities to reticulate. Okay. So we check the reservoirs, we check the dam levels weekly, and annually there's also an assessment in terms of water levels throughout the country. Okay. And hence, we can now tell you that we're not going to be out of the woods in the foreseeable future. Mm. Um, we will only be in a comfortable situation as a country within a period of three years. Sure. Whilst we might be having good rains from March and the best around September next year, remember with this drought, you might now with the good rains have floods. So what must we do? All of us who must put up systems to harvest water. Mm. In your yard, in the school, in a hospital, let's harvest the rainwater mm. and utilize the rainwater and save a, a surface water. The other thing that we are also doing is to build more catchment areas. There are many streams in South Africa that just flow back into the sea. Mm. So we definitely have to deal with that. But we must now come to live with the reality that South Africa have been spoiled over time irresponsibly, mm. where everything was dependent on surface water, when we could use groundwater, when you could recycle your water, and when you could even use uh, waste water to, 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 to distribute into industry and so forth. We're looking at various solutions. Desalination is one of the mm. things that we are looking at. Seawater, um, that's sea awesome. Yes, mm. cleaning seawater and redistributing. But it starts with me and you. Use a cup to brush exactly. your teeth. One thing I have to ask you is the final sort of uh, sentiment to this whole topic is that uh, as the end user, we might feel like, oh, but that's a future problem. Only when there's real crisis will I want to start engaging with this. Mm -hmm. What kind of, what can we expect if we don't act now? As you and I start acting right now, what can we expect in the future? What are some of those dire consequences? You would have deprived generations to come. A, a, a very important precious resource, which is water. Mm. What we are going through, like I'm saying, will only be out of the woods in a period of three years. Okay. So if me and you don't change our behavior, it will not be something that will be good, not only for you, but for generations to come. The realities of climate change mm. are upon us. Let us adapt in mm. the way we do things. You must never fill a kettle to prepare a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Save the other volume for your own grandchild. Exactly. Because remember, if it so happens that this is the last drop, South Africa, naturally, is a water-scarce country. We rely mostly 
on shared basins with many nations across that are, are, are within the, the, the region. The, the economic hub of South Africa, Gauteng, relies on water from Lesotho. Mm. We now have to deal with those realities, and therefore, every South African must begin to change. But our investment is on education. Mm -hmm. Because if we, we, we don't help those who are coming after us, we are not going to make sure, therefore, that there's inherent change that does not need anybody yeah. to give a warning. But it starts with me and you. Exactly. Think about tomorrow. It, it's not an entertainment center, mm -mm. Th that shower that you get into. Get in, don't sing, get out. <laughs> don't use a bath. Use uh, a shower. Once mm -hmm. a week you may have a bath, but recycle your water. Yeah. Remember, the, the, the people who live in the rural areas, who collect 25 liters of water, from a river where they actually collect this water that is also being used by animals are the ones who are recycling. Yeah. And now with the drought, we now have to still look after me and you. Mm -hmm. And whilst they're patiently waiting, I think we must not stretch their patience. Absolutely. Let's stretch the availability of this drop to reach out to all South Africans. But we must thank South Africans who have been very patriotic. Yeah. We've seen the Proteas, we've seen the uh, hashtag uh, uh, hyd Operation Hydrate, where South Africans have come out, all of them, to say, let's think about those who do mm. not have. We've seen religious people praying. We've seen traditional leaders doing their own things. Anyone with any solution in this platform, mm. let us all be ambassadors. Find something that's unique to you that you can contribute to. So, Minister, I really, really appreciate this time. Thank you so much for joining us in the loft. You're welcome. Thank <laughs> you very much. For most of us, water is readily available, and we usually don't question where it comes from. As South Africans, we receive clean, safe water. In times like these, we need to be aware and proactive about the current situation. It can be as easy as getting that leaking tap fixed. Skip loves your clothes as much as you do. Back to Afternoon Express. It's been such an exciting show. It's the first time I've ever got a chance to interview a minister, and it really is exciting for us to engage on these uh, tough issues. And we're now moving on to our next one. Now, roughly a third of the people in South Africa still live in rural communities today. Now, with the economy in a big trouble and droughts having massively negative impacts uh, on these communities, today we're discussing what's being done to help develop and empower the rural areas of South Africa. And joining us is a senior economist at AgriSA, Tabing Kosi. Welcome to our loft. It's cool to have you. Thank you. Good so, afternoon to your viewers. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's very excited to have you sitting down on the couch with us because now we're kind of uh, shifting our attention to something very important and mm. uh, that has got to do with rural communities. Mm. What exactly defines a rural community? Because if a third of our population is living there, mm. we need to know what that is. See, that statistic is a bit dodgy because I think as a country, we still have not defined what rural means in the ah. context of South Africa. So there are a number of definitions flying around. Some use, you know, whether uh, you know, an area is densely populated or not, or whether it used to be a former homeland. So there really isn't one broad definition, which is part of the problem. Mm. Um, but currently, I think we're using, you know, we say, you know, was it a homeland? Um, is it in an area that is quite sparsely populated? And that is what we consider to be rural. Okay. And also, so what happens with rural communities is that they're usually on the outskirts of where economic activity is, is, is happening and where things are, are going on. And the problem with that means that usually the filter down process of the big effects that are happening in the cities, they get the sort of like last little drips and drabs of that. And it's almost a forgotten part of society when it comes to economic uh, development and process, etc. Um, so when it comes to rural areas, um, what are some of those crises we're facing in terms of that communication between where the economic hubs are and where our rural communities are? So it's been a big struggle trying to level the playing field between your urban centers and rural areas um, really since the dawn of our democracy. So we had RDP that spoke about bringing rural communities to the mainstream of the economy because really this marginalization has been an issue for quite some yeah. time. And of course, because they're on the outskirts, we have a lot of migrant labor um, that really comes from rural areas into urban centers, which has its own social implications as well. So there are quite a number of programs. I mean, most recently we saw the National Development Plan really focusing on rural development and eradicating poverty, especially in rural areas. And we have the comprehensive rural development program. So there really is no shortage of programs in this area. Yeah. The, the key challenge has really been implementation. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Are they effective? 
That's very hard to say. We have had some progress. We have to admit that there are people that have been pulled out of poverty since democracy, but there's really a large number that are still very poor, um, that are living below the bread line, and the majority of those people are in rural areas. Mm -hmm. So we still have a very, very long way to go, um, but the programs are there. I think the political will to implement them is really what's needed mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah, I'm sure, exactly. And I think what a lot of South Africans may be asking is, what actually, what role does rural communities play in our economy at the moment? What role do they play in society? And if we are having such a large population there, why are we, why are we trying to change that? Well, I think rural communities play a very, very important role. I mean, they are citizens just like any of us. And I think a lot of the time we you know, stay in our urban centres and we forget that there are people who are not living as well as we are, that do not have the same access to services um, that we do, even though the Constitution guarantees those rights for them yeah. as well. Yeah. So I think, you know, what I spoke about, about migrant labour, we get a lot of people coming from rural areas, not by choice, but really because there are no opportunities. And, and that, of course, affects um, the overpopulation that we are seeing, um, yeah. you know, informal settlements in Gauteng, for instance, largely because people do not have opportunities in rural areas. Yeah. So really they play quite an important role in bringing stability to, to the country and really just ensuring that we move forward both socially and economically. Yeah. And obviously with those sort of areas a lot of the focus tends to be around agriculture if I'm mm. not mistaken. There's a lot of agriculture that goes on yeah. in those communities and you, you, we just spoke a little bit about the drought not too long ago and it's, it's interesting to see that they're probably going to be the ones that are going to be affected the most because it's small businesses, subsistence farmers, small new farms that have just yeah. set up and having to close their doors. Absolutely. I mean, agriculture is not only the main employer in rural areas, but it's also the main economic activity. So really a crisis in agriculture is a crisis for rural economies and rural economies and, and rural communities, excuse yeah. me. So really what we're seeing, though, is that the smallest um, farmers, subsistence guys, people who really produce for their own families and maybe for their neighbours, people who had maybe five head of cattle, those are the ones that are most affected, and that's mm. quite unfortunate. Um, you know, these individuals don't really have the safety nets that big mm. farmers have. Um, they don't quite have the support mechanisms that me mainly uh, you know, established commercial farmers would have. Mm. So we're really seeing a lot of rural communities being left quite vulnerable yeah. as a result of so the drought. You I'm hearing a lot about rural rural development and I'm, we're hearing it in the news you mentioned it quite a lot and I honestly do feel a little bit disconnected from that what are we trying to develop because my understanding is when I was at university we discussed quite a lot about uh, economic development and particularly the way that cultures are formed in our country yes. and there's a lot of cultural influence particularly in our rural communities there's different legal systems that, that, that run in those communities do they want to be transformed do they want to be made into city centers what is the what is that sort of development going on is there is there development like that I think when we talk about rural development, we're trying to ensure that people in rural communities live a decent have a decent living, um, you know, that there's no poverty, that they have access to health care, which is mm. something that everyone needs. Of course, you know, our constitution really protects the rights to self-identification. So we're not trying to make everyone, you know, a Santa and kind of yes. more, right? Westernize them. Absolutely mm. not. But we're really trying to ensure that they have a good livelihood, even though, yeah. you know, they do have the right to self-identification in terms of, you know, the legal structures that they choose to follow and, and the customary law that they choose to follow. Yeah. That is fine, but we really need to ensure that people have at least access to basic services. Absolutely. So when we talk about the, recently the, the President's State of the Nation address, um, what do you feel has been neglected when it comes to rural communities from, a, from an economics point of view or fr from a sort of structural and policy perspective? Mm. I think normally our policies have been very urban-centred. Uh, you know, we've really, in anything that we talk about, I mean, we talk about ESCOM and the electricity crisis and we talk about load shedding and, and we think about how it affects businesses in large cities. We very rarely talk about, you know, what the impact of everyday things has in rural communities. So I think, you know, the shift that we've been starting to see over the last, say, three or four years is really looking at well, how does this affect rural communities? And we mm. saw even in the nine-point plan about, you know, revitalizing agriculture and agro-processing, really yeah. showing a, cre a clear realization that there are jobs to be created there. Um, we saw that, you know, in, in the 12-point in the 12, um, in the 12 point plan, I think, of a few years ago, where we spoke about revitalizing rural communities mm. and bringing some life there. So there's really quite a lot of emphasis on rural communities yeah. and I think it's about time. Awesome and I think it's also about time that we yeah. have these kinds of conversations so you're not going to go anywhere. I'm going to continue with this chat. I just wanted to lay a bit of a groundwork as where we are in our country at the moment with regards to rural communities so don't don't go anywhere okay. So that forget it's time for us to go and check out what's happening in the kitchen. I think that's something slightly sweeter. <laughs> yeah, definitely much sweeter. Okay so we're gonna make vanilla sugar lumps now. Yes, okay so it's perfect. It's a vanilla version of what we made earlier. Yes. Mm -hmm. so we have our half a cup of granulated slatty sugar. Mm -hmm. Get into 
the cup of the food processor. And again, the liquid this time is the vanilla essence of okay. flavoring, and it's okay. also the binding agent, sort of. Put that on there. And I see you've got a giant cake here. What's yes. going on? So the sugar lumps are good for more than just your sugar, your, the sugar in your tea. <laughs> We're going to decorate that cake with some sugar with lumps some that we've sugar made. Lumps. So again, same process as before, uh, just uh, mixing it up. Mm -hmm. um, I've pre-prepared some here, so we're just going to do that again. And again, just to recap, we push the sugar in. You have to push it in really, really firmly. Right, right. And then we turn it over. Um, and essentially, obviously, you want to use as much, or you want to finish that up in yeah, that so process. Yeah, so you want to make yeah. it quite level at the top. Exactly. Okay. And now that will dry out to become this. For an hour. Yes, for mm -hmm. an hour. Okay. And now you can feel like it's really hard and they're stackable. So... Mm -hmm. You can put them in your bowl, or they're really great. They make nice little DIY gifts as well, so you can put them in a jar. Yes, and you gifts can put them stuff. in like a little, um, a little mason little, jar. Yeah, 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 exactly. Little bag. Yeah, the ribbon. Exactly, be okay. really, really cute. <laughs> um, so party favors. But today we are going to use it to decorate a to cake decorate. as well. Yeah. So if you have an icing like a cream cheese frosting that's not that sweet, the sugar um, decoration is not going to be too hectic, yeah, and it'll yeah. also add like a bit of a cr crisp and crunch. So we, we have... It be lovely for like a baby shower cake. Exactly. Or yeah, little girl's cute. birthday party. Yeah. I remember when I was really small, I had a cake that had um, sugar decorations on it. So it totally is a thing, I promise. I know. It looks absolutely gorgeous. It's also a fun thing you can do with your kids exactly. at home. Exactly. It's yes. so easy. You don't need yes. any heat. It's not dangerous. Um, yeah. It's just really quick and easy and simple. Um, so we've got those on there. And now I've mixed an edible gold glitter with some vodka. Um, I know it sounds a little bit dangerous, but wow. the, the vodka evaporates once it goes <laughs> onto the cake. Edible gold glitter. So yeah. does it come already fine like that? It's a powder, yeah. It's a powder, okay. So we've mixed it with the vodka, which is going to eva evaporate, and we're just going to sprinkle some It seems some you can mix vodka with anything. Exactly. <laughs> you mix it with vodka because if you mix it with water, it's going to lose its sheen. Okay, okay. So we're just going to... Got a little bit crazy there. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll go. move out the way. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. Well, we're crazy, yeah. And you can just, you know, obviously do it onto like a plate that yes. you can then transport it onto your stand and you let it dry because if you touch it, it's going to... It's going to smudge or it's just yeah. not dry yet. Yeah, exactly. So very simple but effective. It's really nice for kids' parties. The vodka does evaporate, like I said, so it's... Safe for kids. It sure um, smells like vodka. <laughs> <laughs> That'll go away. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget the recipe is on our website, afternoonexpress.co.za. Now, after the break, we're chatting to Afrikaans singer-songwriter Andre Fento, who's written a song to raise funds for drought relief, as well as a representative of Gift of the Givers, who are the largest disaster response NGO in Africa. We'll be right back. Five Roses blends only the top two leaves of the finest Ceylon teas. Because nobody makes better tea than you and Five Roses. Welcome back to the best way to spend your afternoons with us right here on Afternoon Express. Now, with all the problems faced by the agricultural sector at the moment, it's comforting to know that there are people dedicating their time and lives to making a positive difference. We're joined by renowned singer and songwriter Andre Fenter, who has written a song to raise money for AgriSA's Drought Disaster Fund, and Sadiq Nata, who represents the Gift of the Givers Foundation, which is the largest disaster response NGO in Africa. Gentlemen, it's really cool to have you on the couch with us today, but two industries kind of sort of combining together to create change. Yeah, thanks for having us, and I think um, it's nice to see that uh, different worlds come, come together and, and maybe get a picture for what's happening. Totally. So, yeah. Andre, let's begin with you and your, your, your relationship with uh, AgriSA. How did that collaboration come about? Did you approach them and say, listen, I want to use my services? Did they approach you? Was it a mutual thing? Well, um, we started thinking about the song, and obviously I, I'm, uh, I'm originally from the Free State. And in December, I saw what's happening with the weather and what's happening on the farms. And mm. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a singer, I'm in the music industry, let's write a song. And I approached them and they said, listen, we can use our platform, get it out to our partners. And uh, yeah, it was, it was in a week, it was done in a week. It, the song was written in two hours, um, recorded the next day, and the next week it was out. So, um, sure. and it's really a song of hope uh, for me. Um, mm. 
Um, so I think uh, not just about the drought, but for everybody just listening to a song, I th it gives you hope and it gives you a mm. positive attitude. Or a sense of an, uh, a good outlook to, to look towards. Absolutely, and I think we need it. Yeah. Why water? H how did the water restrictions or the sort of drought affect you? And why did you choose to get involved with that specific initiative? Well, I didn't, I didn't think of it at all. Um, I was driving th through the Free State and I saw, I stopped and I saw that, you know, it was looking like a desert. And I couldn't believe because it's the first time ever I've seen it. And mm. I thought to myself, I must write a song. And I approached some guys to help me. And um, I think it was just a natural um, flow of what happened, you know, doing the song. And <laughs> Good use of words, natural and flow. I yeah, like it. it was just, <laughs> it was meant to be, I think, uh, for yeah, me. Totally. So, Sadiq, let's turn our attention to Gift of the Givers. And um, we'll get into what both of you are up to in sort of the yeah. space. But as the biggest NGO when it comes to relief and disasters uh, in Africa, I mean, you guys have got a huge role to play and you play quite a big chunk of that role. Um, what exactly are you guys doing to, to help with the drought at well, the moment? Well, we've been helping, we've been assisting with the drought. Firstly, thank you for uh, allowing us to have this platform. Sure. Um, we've been assisting with the drought for the past two months. Uh, we've gone past the initial distribution of water and basic aid, and now we're moving on to more long-term projects uh, in addition to uh, provision of water mm. and animal feed. So building reservoirs, building boreholes, educating the people how to mm. save water and conserve it in the future. It's pretty strange for me to hear you say that because for me, I would imagine that a lot of South Africans were on board with this sort of helping with the droughts. But it seems that 90% of South Africans aren't and Gift of the Givers wouldn't get involved unless we're in crisis, yeah. right? Um, yes, that's very true. We are a disaster response uh, yeah. organization. So are so we in disaster? Is it a disaster? Are we in trouble? Um, yes, we are in trouble. If the agricultural sector is hit by a drought, it, it's, it's a huge loss, not only for the people involved, but uh, economically. So we need to do everything in our power to try and assist wh wherever we can. Mm. Um, people without water, it's one of the most basic needs of a human being. Mm. It, seeing someone without water is, is quite heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've seen in the news a lot about the big agricultural sectors uh, taking a bit of a hit and having to be bailed out of circumstances, but I'm pretty sure that the small businesses that are involved in the agricultural sector, the subsistence farmers, etc., are struggling the most. They are struggling the most. Um, they've been hit the hardest by the drought because they have no um, financial backing from any other source to bail them out. They don't have um, the resources to survive a drought, to lose half their crop or to lose half their cattle. Mm. There's no resources backing them up. Okay. Sure. And Andre, obviously your involvement with AgriSA is, is slightly different to what Give to the Givers is doing, mm. um, but what exactly are uh, AgriSA doing with the circumstance and how are they using your sort of platform to, to build awareness and also maybe help with financial relief? Yeah, I think my platform is quite easy. Um, we've, we've got the song out on a platform called my, MyTracks.fm uh, mm -hmm. and you can download the, the app on your device and you can buy the song for 20 Rand. And obviously the, that goes to their, to their fund for drought. Um, it doesn't sound a lot, but um, mm. you know, a, a lot of a little makes, makes a big difference. Exactly. And um, as I said, it's a song of hope and we're planning a massive show the 20th of Feb. Uh, we're planning to get 25,000 people there. So sure. if you can get 25,000 people to join in and get the, get the song and, you know, mm. just give the song to a farmer. Just stop and give him the song, just mm. to listen. Um, for me, it's not a money-making thing. I think um, it's really about giving hope. Yeah. And, and that, that changes a lot in people's mm. perception. Yeah, do you think people yeah. are going to obviously s spend that money? And first of all, once they've spent that money, what exactly is AgriSA going to do with it? Well, they've got the drought, uh, the drought relief fund, and I think they uh, they exactly know how to distribute that between their partners. Mm. And I've seen the impact on uh, not only the farmers but the business partners of the farmers. Mm. People don't realize that um, there's a lot of guys, suppliers, yeah, and the suppliers, and and uh, at the end of the day, it's it's us. Uh, it will eat us the hardest, and uh, it will eat the, the low income group uh, very hard at yeah. the moment. I think so. Um, the the chain reaction is for me um, is a bit scary, and I think it is a disaster at the moment. But sure. um, there's always a solution, and I think, as you can see, there's a lot of people standing together, mm. making a plan, uh, working together with either water, yeah. the music guys, um, having the big concert. There's TV a lot of stuff talking happening. about it. TV shows, yeah. <laughs> uh, everybody is really making a, a small yeah. impact and that will make a big difference. I'm, yeah. I'm really what has the response been so far with the song itself uh, in terms of sales, etc.? Well, um, the digital platform is still growing in South Africa, but it's really taken off. We, we did a video of the song and it uh, got viewed um, 25,000 times wow. in 24 hours. So sure, congratulations. That's really, you know, it's, it's, it's encouraging. Not, it's not for me to, to be famous about it, but um, it's for me to get it out there and mm. get people to realize what's going on. Because there's a lot of scenes of the farm and what's happening on the farm so they can see what's, what's happening with the, with the farmers. Yeah. 
And um, yeah, as I said, um, yeah, the response is um, overwhelming. And uh, when you perform the song, when I sing it, I can really see people mm. getting quite emotional. You know, big farmers, sure. big guys. Mm. It's hitting them, um, and I know it will make a it will make a positive impact. Yeah. Definitely, Excellent. I'm sure of it. I can see it. Totally. So obviously, yeah. you guys are, are very involved with trying to get the public behind these sort of things. Yes. But uh, like we mentioned before, Give to the Givers is really doing some good work on the ground too. So this collaboration seems to bring the whole country together. Mm. Um, so Sadiq, in terms of the impact you guys have seen on the ground so far with your projects that must be really rewarding um, what we've seen on the ground was quite devastating <clears throat> excuse me when we initially started we would drive through the free state and suddenly a sandstorm would erupt mm -hmm. it's something I've never seen in South Africa before um, just sand because the crops are dying there's no vegetation to keep everything intact you'd see animals really bare bones yeah. walking along collapsing due to lack of water sure. and then suddenly the whole of South Africa came together and responded in one voice yeah. mm. and it's one of the most heartening things to see when people come together to help others who they have no connection to at all mm. we have an economic connection we have other various connections but there's no contact with these people so to reach in your pocket to help in whatever way you can um, a concert mm. is not a small thing 25,000 people made aware Absolutely. of something um, mm. has a huge impact. So sure. we've mm. been very grateful to the people of South Africa for awesome. their assistance. But there is still a lot to do. So how, what more can we do to help you guys? Um, well, a drought is an act of God. So all we can do is pray and do our best. So provide mm. more water, provide more um, animal feed, donate in cash or in kind. And we can only fill in the holes until we get rain. Sure. Yeah. Amazing. Guys, well, I hope we're going to continue to be able to support you from our side. And as each of us as members of the public, I think it's important for us to get involved. And South Africans, if, obviously, if you want to get involved and have seen all that's gone on on the show today and you want to lend a hand of support, all the information for these two organizations can be found on our website. It's afternoonexpress.co.za. Guys, thank you so much for joining us in the loft today. It's really an honor to see what you guys are doing for our country. It's been yeah. a pleasure. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for also helping out. Oh, it's such a pleasure, guys. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back. Experience the world in a way less limited. Apply today at dinersclub.co.za. Fresh pack. Goodness comes naturally. Good afternoon, South Africa. Welcome to Afternoon Express, live right here on SABC3. It's so great to be with you. Today, we're on the couch with a very important senior uh, economist. Her name is Tabi Nkosi, and it's really cool to have you with us in the loft. Before, we were discussing about policy and rural communities and the effect that this sort of economic crisis, etc., has on our rural communities with regards to development. I'm interested to find out from you around uh, sort of policy all the way being filtered down to the ground. Mm. How is policy being implemented? Are there community leaders? Are there people that are engaging with these topics? Or are we just sitting in our homes in the southern suburbs and pretending like we know what communities need? Well, more and more, we are starting to see community involvement. That, unfortunately, was not the case um, a few years ago. Um, you know, we, we'd have a top-down policy approach, and that mm. didn't work. So we really didn't involve rural communities in deciding what it is that they want. Mm. Um, and I think more and more, we're starting to decentralize policy making and really decentralize implementation, more importantly. Yeah. So municipalities are playing a much bigger role. Um, we're seeing a greater role being played by traditional leaders. Um, mm. We're seeing a lot more community involvement just by everyday rural people just really getting involved and being more informed about what it is that's going on in their world. Mm. And obviously that was the reason why we had two different parliaments. I mean that, that local government was meant to be the most important side of it because every different province has something different that they need to, to contribute from. But I'm really interested to find out you mentioned community leaders and things. Access to information in rural communities is really tough. I mean mm. how do I know as somebody who's in a rural community what is available to me when it comes to grants, when it comes to small business mm. help, when it comes to any kind of economic assistance. That's a good point because we really haven't seen the kind of technology uptake in rural communities as we have in urban centres. So, you know, a lot of people can't just log on to the net and kind of check out what the government's up to. Yeah. So, you know, we have a greater role being played by mobile officers. We have a lot of municipalities that go down to the ground. We see a lot of traditional leaders, for instance, yeah. starting to really work <coughs> as being the, the conduit of information, especially for crucial mm. issues. We have mobile ambulances. I think the key thing is really bringing the message to the people and not necessarily expecting the 
people to go out there and get it because yeah. that is very, very difficult. I'm sure. And it's going to take a really long time, I think, is the biggest thing, is you've got to get this message out to a lot of people who don't have access to that kind of information. And I know that it is going to take time. And we've spoken about this about our democracy. Everyone says that we're so far in advance. Why mm -hmm. are we not where we should be? These things take time. But have there been sort of policies that you've seen that you're really proud of, things that you've seen that are working yeah. in our rural communities? Well, there's a lot of things that I'm actually quite excited about. I'm excited that we are we have this renewed focus on agro-processing, and, and I know it sounds really, like, nerdy, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really passionate that, you know, we've discovered the gem that is agriculture, so yeah. that, that's, that's really cool. Um, and I think, you know, I'm excited about, you know, the development and formation of small business departments, for instance, and really a realisation that small businesses are going to drive this country forward. Um, there's been a big focus by development funding institutions and just government institutions that are set up to fund rural initiatives. And we've yeah. seen the, the IDC really focusing on agro-processing and rural development. Yes. We've seen, you know, the Small Enterprise Finance Agency. So there's a lot of great things that are going on. But the issue, though, is how do we access them and really are people really taking advantage of these great opportunities that are mm. out there? Um, and I think that's really the issue. Well, you're asking a very tough question. I'm going to throw it right back at you. How do we get people to access that information? How do we encourage people to engage with these kinds of processes? You know, as cliche as this sounds, really knowledge is power. Um, what we've seen is people don't know what is out there. Um, but, you know, there are district offices for, especially for the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform. They have offices all over. They have mobile offices now, no. you know, for land claims. And people just need to access them. Um, you know, they are there. Mm. Visit those centres. Um, I think maybe the approachability is a bit of a concern that people don't feel that these institutions yeah. are approachable. But the information is there. And I think, you know, it's really for people to take initiative and really claim what what is up? Exactly. It's up to the people. And this exactly. is why it's an important conversation I have to have with you now because a lot of people that are watching the show right now might be saying to you, well, listen, I sit at a home with the television. I'm already not in a rural community technically. Mm. So um, what? how does this affect me? Do I care? Well, you should care. Um, the development of rural communities is a responsibility for all of us, um, not just, you know, from a patriotic point of view that, you know, we're all South Africans and we're all entitled to the same rights, but also noting that if things don't work for rural um, populations, mm. they don't work for us um, mm. for a number of reasons, you know, for crime and, and also we have a bigger burden on social grants, etc. But I think there's a lot that we can do. You know, how many of us fly to Durban instead of just driving there and going into the small Dorpies, you know, really supporting those mm. local enterprises, those rural enterprises? Um, yeah. You know, very, very few of us do that. Yeah. Um, a lot of ladies in rural areas make jewellery and they make clothing. We don't buy it because, you know, we kind of look down on that. So it's really about really looking at ourselves and saying, mm. how do we support these enterprises more and being really more... Yeah. Uh, more proudly South African and yes. really contributing to the development. Yeah, of our you might nation. not be getting the sort of brands that you've wanted out of it, but what you are doing is supporting our economy, which then boosts it and gives more money to be able to spread widely. And I know everyone's going to say, but oh, the government's going to misspend my money. But let's pretend like we're in, we're in a, a closed system that is perfect. Mm. Um, what are some of the other things that we can do to support rural communities um, besides only supporting our economy, unless that's the only way? No, I guess it's, it's also about understanding the different challenges that are faced there. Um, you know, I think we really don't know enough about what is going on outside of the borders of metropolitans. Really understanding those challenges, really working with NGOs in those areas. It's not just about economic development. You know, there are, there are NGOs doing excellent work on HIV programs, on programs that work on bringing health services to people. Mm. And really, these NGOs are cash-strapped. The funding is just never enough. I think there's a lot that we can do to support the people that are doing excellent yeah. work in those communities. Awesome. So this has been such a fascinating chat. I've learned so much, and I think it's we mustn't turn our, our blinkers on when we see when you have conversations like this because we do have a role to play. I mean, mm. if you're not supporting our economy, no one else can support these communities too. So it's been honoured to have you on our couch. Hopefully, you've opened the minds of many South Africans and realised that as much as we're diverse in race, we're also diverse in the way that we live, um, and it's important for us to support everybody. So thank you for joining us on the couch today. Great, thank you. I want to sweeten this conversation up, and I know we've got some sugar on the couch so, on at the table. <laughs> so I'd love you to come and join us. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. That was a really pertinent conversation on rural development. Well done, guys. Yeah, thank look, you. It's fascinating stuff. I mean, yeah. to be honest, do I buy local? Do I spend enough I money know. buying local products? I, I mean, right? it's important right. that I do because it is being produced by these yeah. rural communities. And I think it's really important that we do. Well, so I contributed a little bit to our community here and I made sugar loaves. <laughs> well, while you guys get uh, all your sugar in the system, make sure you guys join us for Afternoon Express tomorrow. Uh, and tune in early specifically because during the first 15 minutes of the show, we're on the couch with businesswoman and former Miss South Africa, uh, Amy Kleinans-Kurd. And in the kitchen, we're making an ultimate burger called The Goodness Me.
sounds delicious, yeah, right? Yeah, it does. You guys are going like, I want that burger, I don't want a cake, but you guys just eat it, it looks delicious. Um, oh, Tabby, any final comments for South Africans? I think really, if, if the drought has really taught us any things that we need to come together, if we totally. saw this type of patriotism and, and support throughout, I think we'd be a great country. Amazing. Yeah. All right, so that you heard it straight from the horse's mouth. Good night, happy eating, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Never feel good production. Hi, YouTubers. Thank you so much for watching. Your support means the world to us. Join the Afternoon Express family by subscribing to our channel right here. And we'll keep you up to date with all our recipes and, of course, our fabulous episodes. Also, feel free to leave a comment and share this video. We do love it when you express yourself.